This is video 5 in the topic how does a nuclear power plant work. In this video we're going to be looking at AC and DC electricity. So in this video we're going to be looking at electricity again, just like we were in the very first topic where we were considering street lights. In this video we're going to be considering how we get the electricity from the nuclear power plant, or in Australia we don't use nuclear power plants, so from whichever power plant it is, to our homes. So when electricity was first discovered and started to be utilised to run our businesses and our homes, especially for electrical lighting, there was a lot of debate about whether AC current or DC current was better. It actually came to be known as the War of Currents and got quite heated and quite a lot of propaganda was used. So if you're interested in history, then you may want to look up some information about the War of Currents. So there was two contenders. There was direct current. In direct current, the electrons travel along the wires in pretty much straight lines with an average speed going in the direction the current travels. So this is actually what we've seen so far. Now in alternating current, the charge carriers actually move backwards and forwards while the current moves onwards. So this is a bit like a wave where the particles move backwards and forwards in simple harmonic motion, but the energy moves onwards in a constant direction. Now, hopefully you know who won this debate because in Australia we have 50 hertz AC power which is supplied to our homes at 240 volts. So AC current one. So why? Well it actually comes down to the invention of a very useful piece of technology called the transformer. And the transformer lets us convert the voltage of one AC source into a different voltage and so this lets us change the voltage at which we transmit current. So great, but why would we want to do that? Well, as we'll see in a minute, it can be a lot more efficient to transmit current at very high voltages over long distances. And so being able to do what's called stepping up the voltage and then transmitting it along the long distances at that very high voltage means that a lot more of the power which is generated in our power plants gets to our homes. So in Australia, typically only about 1% of the power which is generated in the power plants is lost in the electric cables on the way to our homes. So let's have a look at a quick, at a simple model now to show this efficiency gain. So in our simple model, we've got a power plant. It's applying electricity to 10 homes here. Now we're going to assume that each of these 10 homes requires 1000 watts of electricity. For now let's assume that this is 100% efficient. So all the electricity which is produced by the power plant gets to the homes. In that case the amount of power that's needed is going to be the 10 homes, the 1000 watts each and so we will need 10,000 watts. So we're going to have 10,000 watts of power flowing along this cable here. Now let's assume that this station supplies it at a voltage of 120 volts and that that's the voltage that they want in the homes. Well in that case we can work out what current is going to flow through this wire here. As we know that P is equal to VI we saw that in the street light topic, power is equal to voltage times current. So we know that the current in this wire is going to be the power flowing through it over the voltage. And so that's going to be the 10,000 watts over the 120 volts. And so we're going to have a current of 83.3 amps, which is quite a high current flowing through that wire there. Now the problem is, as electrons move conducting the current, whether it's AC or DC, they're going to collide with the nuclei of the atoms making up the metal and this is going to lose energy. We know that wires carrying a high current heat up and in that heat loss we lose energy. So we can work out the amount of heat lost, the rate that 
we're losing energy using P is equal to I squared R, where this is the current and this is the resistance. And so we can, for this wire, let's assume that it has a resistance of 1 ohm. Resistance is equal to 1 ohm. So the loss of power in this wire is then equal to 83.3 squared times the resistance, which is 1. And so we're going to lose 6,944 watts as we get the power from the power station to the homes. So rather than generating the, just the 10,000 watts, the power station is going to have to put out output 16,944 watts. And so we can work out the efficiency. This is the useful power, which is the power that actually gets to the homes over the generated power. which is the 10,000 watts over 16,944, which gives us 59%, so 0.59, which is 59%. Okay, so we've got 59% efficiency. Now, what could we do to improve that efficiency? Well, if we can't reduce the resistance of this wire, presumably we've designed it to be with as little resistance as possible, the only other option is to reduce the current. But if we want to carry the same amount of power but with less current, then we're going to have to up our voltage. So if we up our voltage, we will reduce the current and hence the power loss. So let's imagine that we do that. Let's um, transmit power at 10 times that voltage. Let's do 1,200 volts. In that case, we know that the current flowing along the wire I is equal to P on V is equal to the 10,000 over the 1,200. So in this case, we get 8.33 amps. And so the power loss is going to be equal to 8.33 squared times 1, so this will be 100 times smaller than that, so 69.44 watts. And so we've reduced the loss a lot and increased the efficiency by a factor of 100 by increasing the voltage by a factor of 10. So this is why we want to use a transformer to increase the voltage. It allows us to lose a lot less electricity as we transport the power. So the transformer is what really won the war for AC current. So let's have a look at exactly how a transformer works. So a transformer consists of an iron core, which looks a bit like this. Around that iron core, we have two coils of wire. We have the primary coil, and we send a current through an alternating current through that primary coil. We then have a secondary coil. And it's the secondary coil where we get the current out of the transformer at its new voltage. So let's have a look at how it works. It works through something called self-induction. So first of all, let's imagine the current at an instant in time flowing through this primary coil. Now if we're looking at our coil from on top, and we see that that current is flowing in an anti-clockwise direction, then we know that that's going to induce a magnetic field, and in that case, the North Pole is going to be upwards. And so we will get magnetic field lines going through the center of that solenoid, or that coil of wire, which look like this. Now, these magnetic field lines don't stop. They go all the way through our iron core as iron is a ferromagnetic material and it wants all its magnetic domains to align. And so those magnetic field lines travel through the secondary coil as well. And now the thing is, we were considering it at one instant in time, but in reality we're applying an alternating current. So as we're constantly changing the current, and the magnetic field generated inside a solenoid is given by the permeability mu times the number of turns times the current, and this current's constantly changing, the magnetic field is also constantly changing. 
And so we have a constantly changing magnetic field going through that secondary coil as well. And so now we can use Faraday's law to work out what the EMF or the voltage induced in that secondary coil is going to be. So Faraday's law tells us, with the adaption for lots of loops, because we have lots of loops in this case, that the induced EMF in the secondary coil is equal to minus the number of loops in the secondary coil, which is ns, times the change in the magnetic flux over time. So d phi b dt. And now when the secondary coil gets an induced current flowing through it, it also generates a magnetic field, which adds to the first magnetic field. But because both the primary coil and the secondary coil are on that same iron core, we have the same magnetic flux and the same changing magnetic flux through both coils. So we can use Faraday's law to also write down the expression for the EMF induced in the primary coil. We've got epsilon p is equal to minus np d phi b dt. But that changing magnetic flux is constant, so d phi b dt is the same in both cases. So what we can do is now equate these two equations. And so if we divide the two equations by each other, cancelling off that common factor, we end up with the, the voltage or the EMF in the secondary coil over the voltage or the EMF in the primary coil is equal to the number of turns in the secondary coil over the number of turns in the primary coil. So if we want to get a really high voltage in our secondary coil, this tells us how to do it. The voltage in the secondary coil is equal to the voltage in the primary coil times the number of turns in the secondary coil over the number of turns in the primary coil. So we just need to have a lot more turns in our secondary coil than our primary coil. So this has shown how the induced voltage changes, but how about the current? Well, in order to make the current, in order to calculate the current, to make it easy, we're going to assume that no power is lost. So this is a very, very efficient transformer. It's not losing energy in the form of heat, etc. So the power that we put in to the primary coil is transferred to power over in the secondary coil. So we've got, we know from the very first topic you did that you can calculate power using the formula power is equal to the voltage times the current. So this tells us that if the power in the primary is equal to the power in the secondary, then the voltage times the current in the primary is equal to the voltage times the current in the secondary. And so the current in the secondary over the current in the primary is equal to the voltage in the primary over the voltage in the secondary. So this tells us that if we increase the voltage of the current coming out of the secondary coil, we actually decrease the current a lot. And it's this decreasing current while carrying the same amount of power that lets it be so efficient to transmit these, this electricity at that very high voltage over long distances to people's homes. Let's have a look at an example now where we will calculate the, the voltage and current in, an, in a transformer. So the question is, we want a transformer that transforms 120 volts into 1,200 volts. Part A, if the primary coil has 85 turns, how many turns does the secondary coil have? And part B, if 83 point 3 amps flows in the primary coil, what current flows in the secondary coil? Okay, so we've got some transformer with a primary coil here with VP, NP and IP and a secondary coil over here with VS, NS and IS. And so this is what's called a step up transformer we've got 120 volts here and we want to get 1200 volts here. So that's our Vs and that's our Vp. And so we can just use that the number of turns in the secondary coil and the number of turns in the primary coil is equal to the voltage in the secondary coil over the voltage in the primary coil. So this tells us that Ns is equal to Mp Vs on Vp, which is equal to 85 times 
1200 over 120. So when we divide this by this, we get left with 10. So this is equal to 850. So we need 850 turns in our secondary coil. Now part B asks us if 83.3 amps is in the primary coil. And so we know that VPIP is equal to VSIS. And so the current in the secondary coil is equal to VPIP on VS. And so this is 120 over 1200 times 83.3. So this is 1 on 10. So this is 8.33 amps flows through the secondary coil. So in our power grid, we've got electricity, which is generated in the power plant, be it a nuclear power plant or another type of power plant. This is generally generated at around a voltage of, say, 12,000 volts. That electricity then goes to a step-up transformer where it's stepped up to a voltage of around about 240,000 volts to really reduce that current. It then travels a very long distance through power lines to the outskirts of the city where it will be used. When it gets to the outskirts of the city, it goes into a step-down transformer, which typically brings it to a voltage of around about 8,000 volts. It then gets sent out to the streets and the local residences and just before it gets sent to our homes it goes through another step down transformer, a small one up in the power lines outside your house and this steps it down from that 8000 volts down to the 240 volts that we use at home. So we use lower voltages in our homes because they're safer than the really high voltages. But then we have the really high voltages to make it efficient so that we're not losing a lot of energy as it's transmitted. Now if you were to install something like solar panels at home, often these solar panels produce DC electricity. And so this is not always converted to AC as it doesn't need to be transmitted over long distances. So if you have an off-the-grid solar system, then it's quite likely that it will be DC. And there's advantages. You don't lose energy when you convert from DC to AC. So there's advantages to keep it, keeping it as DC. There's also disadvantages because most of the appliances that we go and buy in shops are made to run off the 50 hertz, 240 volts AC power supply. So we've seen that there was a lot of debate about whether to use AC or DC power, but that AC power won because of the transformer and the ability to change the voltage and so increase the efficiency of transmitting the power long distances. You also saw how to calculate the voltage change and current change within a transformer. Thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this and also thanks to the FET site for those simulations of AC and DC electric current.